absolutely fabulous to be here. It, 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 it's been a great day, I think, for all of us here. We've met many students in our classes. We've had great questions thrown at us. And we'll be around, I guess, another day. So we'll look forward to meeting you individually uh, as we go forward talking about what we know uh, about whistleblowing and, all, and, all, and sharing experiences, obviously. Uh, the Government Accountability Project began in 1977. We uh, have, since that time, had 5,000 clients. So the one thing that we do is we're the lawyers for whistleblowers. Secondly, what we do is we investigate what they have to say and we try to bring it to national attention and we try to do something positive uh, about the revelations. And we've been involved in revelations already mentioned, uh, dealing with drugs that are unsafe, dealing with nuclear power plants that are, have no quality assurance, dealing with nuclear weapons facilities where there's high level w waste uh, that is leaking. Uh, and those are the kinds of cases we're involved in. We have, there are 25 people that work at GAP and we have something like 50 law students and other interns that work uh, at the project. Uh, a third thing that we do is we're involved in legislation. There have been 52 federal laws that have passed since, uh, passed Congress since 1978, dealing with whistleblowers, uh, obviously trying to get protections for them. And most recently, over the last six to seven years, uh, there have been uh, laws in the corporate area that now protect, hopefully protect, 70 million and more uh, private sector employees, as well as all federal employees except for national security, and also uh, contractors to the federal government, as well as the United Nations, uh, five major development banks such as the World Bank, and in fact, at GAP, we have entertained or had through our offices something like 10,000 foreign visitors uh, over the last 15 years alone uh, sent to us by the State Department. And, and one of the things to note about, we're gonna be hearing about whistleblowers, I just want, there are three things that I think are really notable. One is their courage, you'll see that, and you'll hear about that. Uh, secondly, is in every case of whistleblowing, there are, for every whistleblower, there are hundreds of people who remain silent. I think that should be noted, and it's disturbing. Third, I hope that you also see, is that but for those whistleblowers, we would never know about major problems. And um, we'll be hearing about that as well. Now, I'd like to turn it over to Allison, and um, thanks again for inviting us here, and we have been quite, feel quite welcomed by you. Thank you. I graduated in 1970 from, from West Virginia University in the mining engineering program, worked briefly in the industry, and then came back here in, uh, in 1971, and I've been here about a year when the, um, when the Buffalo Creek Dam failure occurred, and that was in February of 1972, and that was a mine waste dam uh, in Logan County, West Virginia, uh, that contained about 125 million gallons of toxic uh, wastewater from a coal preparation plant. It was operated by a company named the Pittston Company, um, I was sent by the Dean of the School of Mines to Logan County to work with a commission that had been appointed by the governor. And I began uh, doing research into the uh, history of the construction of the dam and, um, and the engineering aspects of the dam construction. What we found was that there was essentially no engineering done. And uh, we had begun putting together a report that uh, that documented the failure of about six government agencies to, to uh, take corrective action. Six government agencies inspected the dam, wrote reports that said the dam's unsafe, and that was it. Nobody took any action. 
the people in the valley had been complaining for years. In fact, four years before, uh, a woman named Pearl Woodrum had written a letter to the governor of the state of West Virginia, and she had written it on February 26, four years before the dam failed. And uh, Miss Woodrum did survive the flood, but the first thing she saw that morning was her own house floating down the river uh, on the crest of the wave. Uh, that killed 125 people and left uh, about 5,000 people homeless. It wiped out 17 communities. It was a tidal wave of toxic coal waste. And what happened with the report? What happened when you presented the report to your uh, dean? <laughs> <laughs> so we had, I worked uh, long and hard uh, uh, with uh, some of the other commissioners, and I we submitted the report to the dean, and the dean and I had actually been arguing about the content of the report because he would, uh, I understood now why he had been appointed the chairman of the committee. He was there to protect the mining company and the coal industry. Fortunately, there were some other people on the committee, most of the other members of the committee, supported uh, the report that I had written and the conclusions that I had written. Uh, and the, one of the, the principal conclusion was that the mining company, the Pittston Company, had shown callous disregard for the lives of the people downstream and that that uh, attitude was prevalent in the mining industry. So Dr. Kelly uh, and I had an argument over that final content of the report and he said if you keep arguing with me you won't have a job at West Virginia University anymore and I said that's fine I quit anyway. And. Uh, and so I began working after that in the coal fields of southern West Virginia and later eastern Kentucky and Virginia, and I'm glad I did. So. Great. Mm -hmm. Well, when you decided to make that change, so um, you, you went to work for the, eventually went to work for the federal government, and you were at the um, Mine Safety uh, Administration, working for the, the Health and Safety Academy. So what happened with the Martin County coal slurry spill? Okay, well, in um, October, again, uh, October 11th, I can remember this, it's my birthday, so on October 11th, 2000, uh, another <coughs> dam failed in uh, Martin County, Kentucky. This time, essentially, the bottom dropped out of the reservoir. Uh, they had built this dam and reservoir over top of underground mine workings, and uh, when the company submitted their plan for approval, to the federal government, the Mine Safety and Health Administration, they had said, we're leaving a 100-foot barrier between the bottom of this reservoir and the underground mine. Well, indeed, there was only about 18 feet left. So the reservoir broke into underground mine, went out into uh, two creeks that drained into the Big Sandy River, and killed everything, uh, as we said earlier, killed everything for 100 miles downstream, killed all the fish, everything along the uh, creek banks. It was 300 million gallons of coal waste in a, a really thick mud form. It was the largest environmental disaster in the eastern U.S. until the uh, BP oil spill a few years ago. So we began doing, I was asked by the head of the uh, Mine Safety Administration to, uh, to lead the uh, geotechnical engineering investigation and that's when we discovered that the company had indeed lied about what was there and we found out that six years before uh, engineers inside the agency had said this dam should not be approved it's unsafe because there had been a failure six years before uh, that the, the agency tried to suppress that report uh, and also try to change the report that we were writing. We had written 10 serious violations. We were planning to recommend criminal action. Um, and on January 21st, 2001, the day George W. Bush was inaugurated, we were ordered to stop our investigation. The company, Massey Energy, was fined $5,000 for the worst environmental disaster in the history of the eastern U.S. up to that time. Um, this spill was 
I, I don't know whether I said this already, this spill was 30 times bigger than the Exxon Valdez uh, spill. So it was a very serious thing. I, uh, when I did protest the changes in the report and refused to sign the report, then there began a campaign to, uh, to fire me. Uh, as, and I was director of the National Mine Health and Safety Academy. Okay, okay. so that at that point you resigned. And Actually, yeah, what happened was uh, we, we, uh, we went back and forth for about a year and a half. I went on 60 Minutes and denounced the uh, Bush administration as the most corrupt administration in history. <laughs> I had my chance to say what I thought, uh, and uh, <laughs> that was fun. Um, and, uh, and it was true, uh, at least as far as mine safety was concerned. Uh, and, uh, and so then uh, rather, they couldn't fire me. Uh, but here's, here was the problem. I went to uh, the Office of Special Counsel in the federal government, which is supposed to protect whistleblowers. And they sent two people, so-called investigators, who really did nothing and allowed the agency attorneys to sit in on their interviews. So no one really wanted to tell the truth. Uh, and so finally I just uh, was transferred to Pittsburgh and resigned. Okay, wow, mm -hmm. what a story. <laughs> okay, Rick, let's shift to you uh, around the same <coughs> time period. It's the first <coughs> term of the uh, George W. Bush administration, and uh, you know, when did you first realize something was wrong at the climate change program? Well, I was, uh, I was in an office about a block from the White House. This was a, this is a Washington, D.C. story. Uh, in the coordination office of the U.S. Climate Change Science Program, and that's the multi-federal agency, $2 billion program that supports all of the scientific research on climate change and the related global environmental issues, the observing systems, the modeling, the scientific research that's done in universities around the country and in federal labs. And I had been in that office since 1995, so I was five or six years and, and had, had worked for the House Science, Space and Technology Committee on, in Congress uh, on the climate change issues uh, for, for a number of years before that. So I had been involved with, with that issue. Um, and um, this was an office that was really in the crosshairs of the collision between climate science and the realities of Washington politics because on one side of us we had the people we were working for which was the senior federal science managers and the scientists that they supported doing reports to Congress, doing strategic plans, supporting scientific working groups. And on the other side we had the White House and this this is an issue that's been sensitive with every administration in one way or another, but when the Bush administration came in, we really started to see something that we hadn't seen before, and it was a matter of not just having a policy of not regulating greenhouse gases, not regulating the energy industry that the administration was close to, but a willingness to, to spin and misrepresent and even censor and suppress climate science communication when it was inconvenient to them politically or to spin the communication to make it conform to their politics. So early on, a few months into office, I heard uh, the President basically misrepresent the conclusions of a report from the National Academy of Sciences on climate change. Um, clearly the administration had backed away from Bush's campaign promises to do something about regulating greenhouse gases. It was started to become evident that the right wing was sort of taking over this issue. How it landed on me, first of all, uh, in um, preparing the, the next year's annual report to Congress on this big research program, w you know, what, what is being learned, what's, what's being done, what's being studied now. Um, not, in other words, not technical scientific journals, but communication to a wider audience. Uh, we were told, I was told, 
by the, by the White House to remove all the references to a major new study that our program had sponsored called the National Assessment of Climate Change Impacts. It was a, the first major study of the potential consequences of global warming for the United States. It had been worked on by a large number of experts for several years. It was like, re delete all references to that report. And following on from that, we saw the federal agencies being told not to talk about it, not to do any follow-on work. It was like a report that was inconvenient for them because it was a scientific assessment that took the global warming problem seriously. It was politically inconvenient, and so they were deep-sixing it. Then uh, uh, I started to get things coming in over the fax machine. It was a low-tech form of censorship. It was report a report to Congress that that had been drafted, edited, revised, reviewed, approved by 13 agencies, and then had to go to the White House for final clearance. And it came back with all these hand marked up edits, what they actually wanted it to say instead of what it said. And all of the edits were slanted in one direction, which was essentially to play down the global warming problem, to to, to put in a lot of fundamental scientific uncertainty language, to delete references to impacts, to delete references to the fossil fuel energy industry. Um, it was a clearly an inappropriate abuse of authority. And it turned out that the person who was doing the final edit was an oil industry lobbyist who had been with the American Petroleum Institute, the, 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 the lobbying arm of the big oil companies, and he was now the chief of staff in the White House Environmental Office. <laughs> and so he was now the political policeman of climate science communication. And, and basically I was expected to take his edits and key them in to the master document, you know, before it went to the printer, and so they make you complicit. And I showed it to one or two people on the staff. It was obvious to everyone what was going on. So that was the first thing I did was I, I, before I passed that along, I made a copy of it and took it, took it with me. And I started doing that, documenting what I was seeing. And a lot of things happened over the next couple of years. Um, when you, if you have power and, and your motivation is to, to to use that power to manipulate communication, there are a lot of different ways to do it. You can tell people not to give interviews, you can take down websites, you can, you can not distribute documents that have already been published, you can censor documents that you have your hands on. There are a lot of different things you can do. I was seeing one part of it, and over time a lot of other things came out. Did you choose to leave your position before speaking out? I mean, how did that? I did, yeah, and it was a, it was a while. It was it was like I guess I said to myself early on, this is a story that has to come out. It's a story that that has to be told. But an, an it would be if it would be obvious who was telling the story, and, and unless I was prepared to be unemployed. Um, uh, that was the choice one had to make because the position would have been, you know, untenable. So, uh, you basically, you know, we, 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 we tried to do sort of damage limitation, but at the point when the second Bush term started in 2005, a number of things happened that made it evident that the political policing of climate change communication was going to be worse rather than better. And finally one day, there was just one thing too many happened, and I found myself saying, okay, that's it. I resigned. I'm not going to work under these conditions anymore. And I, and I resigned with the intention of going public. I didn't really know how I was going to do that. Um, I did not have another job. I did not want a new boss telling me what I could or couldn't say about this. I knew what I wanted to say, if only even if I just wrote a paper about it and put it on a website for you know someone to write a thesis about or historians to see or, 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 or reporters or at least to document what my experience had been. 
And as it turned out, I was able to get a lot more exposure to the story than that. And that's when you went to Gap and, uh, and they helped you go to the media. That's right. And I did, I did you know, have some contacts in the, in the journalism world. I had, there, was, there was a very important reporter at the New York Times, Andrew Revkin, who was... We spoke here, yeah. Yeah, hmm? that's right. been here so yeah and was at that time probably the only print journalist who had global climate change as a beat and was very knowledgeable and, and knew a lot of the cast of characters, understood the program I had been working for, had everyone's cell phone number, had talked to me on background a few times just to clarify a few points for him. Um, so I did notify him when I had resigned because he had the sense that I was kind of sitting on a lot of inside information. And he said, oh good, now you can, now you can sp speak freely. But I was a little concerned because I had taken with me from the office a lot of inside documents that, you know, are supposed to be confidential. So I did get referred to, to the Government Accountability Project, sort of like, to, to, to clarify what my exposure might be. But, you know, I hadn't, I mean... What was the reaction of the Bush administration? About well... So, so with, with GAP, we, we got a front page story in the New York Times, Bush aid edited climate reports, you know, edit softened links to greenhouse gases. And Revkin's story actually had graphics of some of the marked up pages. So it was an iconic story. The White House was not too happy about it. Um, the, the, uh, Bush's press secretary, Scott McClellan, had to answer about 10 or 12 questions about it the day the story came out. It m must have been a slow news day. He really got hammered and he had no idea what to do with it. They said, well, you have this oil industry lobbyist is running your environmental office. What's that? And he said, well, it's just a normal procedure. And he said, but they have this, this whistleblower who said that, he said, well, who is he? You know, why don't you go investigate him? And, I mean, they were just thrashing. And, and, you know, it's interesting. You get a story in the New York Times, it, people pick it up. You know, I got interviewed by all the networks except for Fox, and <laughs> and the radio and radio interviews and and all of that. And um, so the and and and, and um, two days later, uh, the oil industry guy resigned from the White House. And I thought, whoa, that's really because one thing about the Bush Cheney administration is they were so hard-nosed. It was like they were impervious. You couldn't influence them. They did not give a damn what you thought. And this guy resigned. And then a couple days after that, Revkin uh, reported that he had taken a job with ExxonMobil and was moving to Dallas. And I thought, that's more like it. <laughs> There's the old boot in the face, you know. And, um, but that made it a different kind of story. This was not a science story. This was not an ecology story. This was a political story. It was a fox guarding the chicken coop story. And anyone can cover one of those. You know, it had good guys and bad guys and documents and so it was, it, it was, it became a sort of iconic whistleblower story in, in that respect. And so I think perhaps along with a lot of other developments, played a small role in influencing media coverage and public perception of the administration. This was not just a legitimate policy debate. They knew better. You know, if they had an integrity, a scientific integrity problem around global warming along, and they were willing, this was an administration that was willing to misrepresent the intelligence once they had decided they wanted to go ahead and do something. And I just happened to be picking up on the global warming chapter of that story. Great, that's that's really good. But let's let's move on to Wilma. Um, you had a long career working on behalf of the public and workers. So tell us a little bit about what your work has focused on prior to looking into the uh, BP oil spill. Well, before the BP oil spill occurred in April, on April the twentieth of two thousand and ten. I had spent a number of years responding on behalf of the communities to hurricanes. In 2005, we had hurricanes, Christine and Chris, and um, 
in 2008, we had two hurricanes as well. I was out in the field when the bodies were still floating in New Orleans. I was doing damage assessments, needs assessments, and taking samples of the sediment sludge that was washed on shore, which had been in the water bodies for decades and decades, and it was contamination was spread all over. And I was doing this work in Louisiana, Texas, Alabama, Mississippi, and at night when I get back where I had cell service, I would contact the communities that were out of the area and tell them what was going on in their communities. And then we were providing them with the resources they need to survive and hopefully be able to come back. Great. So, you know, your story is going to be a little different than Jack's and Rick's because you own your own small consulting company as opposed to working for the federal government or BP, right? Mm -hmm. That's, uh, so, you know, as Gap notes, citizen activists and scientists um, who are privy to key information about wrongdoing can be whistleblowers too. <coughs> And with your expertise, Wilma, in 2010, you could immediately see problems with the um, oil spill and with the cleanup uh, that others could not. So what were your immediate concerns? Walk us through those first few weeks after the disaster. The first few weeks after the disaster in 2010, there was a huge quantity of crude oil spread on the Gulf of Mexico. It was turned into an aerosol by the high winds and the high seas and blowing on shore making people along the coastal areas as far inland as 100 miles very sick, nausea, respiratory problems, headaches. And then because the fishing grounds were closed immediately as a result of the BP spill, the fishing community was out of business. And they knew the estuaries and the fishing grounds the best because that was their resource. And so they wanted to become the cleanup workers because they thought they were capable of more quickly doing the cleanup to return the environment to what it was before. So they went to work for BP and BP contractors, and BP immediately had them sign away all their rights. So the first week in May of 2010, we went to court and got an order, which BP signed, that they would not enforce any of the giving up of their rights. And then the second week in May, we went back to federal court in New Orleans, and got BP to agree to agree to actually not ignore the workers, but provide them with the proper training, with the proper equipment, and what they needed to appropriately do their work without being injured. And this was 2010. As a result, we had workers that were being exposed to chemicals over and over and over again and made very, very, very sick. And these workers started calling us at night when they'd get in, telling us about the health symptoms. And then they had to go back to work the next day because they desperately needed that paycheck. So what happened was working with Louisiana Environmental Action Network, we started providing them with protective gear, respirators, Tyvek suits, gloves. And their wives started speaking out as a result of workshops I was doing along the coastal areas, talking to them about the aerosol coming on shore as well as the exposure that was going on from the crude oil and the dispersions that were sprayed on the crude oil. So BP was telling the workers, if you don't shut your wife up because she's talking against us, you're gonna be fired. And then when they received the protective gear and the respirators, they were told, if you wore that gear, if you put on the respirator, you're fired. So they had a choice, not wear it and get exposed or lose their job. And they desperately needed the job and the resources. Fascinating. So you didn't work for the BP or the federal government. You were an outsider. Um, but yet you have still suffered reprisal um, in your efforts to raise concerns about the cleanup uh, and the lack of training and. Uh, and protection. So do you want to talk a little bit about that and how it's affected you uh, both personally and professionally? Sure, well, the EPA was very, very responsive when we call them up and tell them about specific areas where there were odor events and we'd say <coughs> we needed air monitors established and they would establish them there. But then at night I get calls from workers on rigs in the general area of where the BP event occurred 
and they said they were being sprayed by the dispersant, which BP was applying to, quote, stop the crude from coming on shore. And when I call EPA and say, okay, I had a call last night from this rig, the workers are being sprayed, and their response was, we don't spray where there are people, and we don't spray where there are mammals. So there's no application of the dispersant being made where people are present. And over and over again, I get the calls at night, and over and over again, I call the EPA. And I was the villain, I was the target, because I was the messenger, and that was the message they didn't want to hear. And a lot of the media started calling, but the workers on those rigs couldn't talk to the media, or they would have lost their jobs as well. So I became the bad guy because I was reporting what was going on, actually going on out in the field. And you were you had mentioned in class today that there was a drive-by shooting at right. your uh, house, and your windows are regularly broken. And at one point, you had to put in some sort of special glass so it wouldn't break. You wanted to, you know. Right. So <laughs> so during the time of the BP spill and the response to it, I was broken in a number of times. We had a drive-by shooting. My husband happened wow. to be out in the. My office is around the corner from my house, and he happened to be out in the yard working on a flower bed and saw this car going up and down the road, came back, and the passenger shot at my office while I was in there working. He called the sheriff's department, and they stopped the car at the nearest intersection, and the passenger was gone, the gun was gone, and the driver didn't know anything about it. And so this was going on constantly and just harassing. Every time the sheriff comes and responds to a burglary at my office, he says, it's just someone harassing you. Right. So this kind of harassment and isolation is common uh, for a lot of whistleblowers. So Rick and Jack, before speaking out, I mean, did you talk with your families and friends before choosing to move forward and, and leave your jobs and expose yourself to this kind of thing? No. <laughs> How about you? <laughs> um, I, I acted. Um, I acted solo. I didn't want to pull anyone who agreed with me into trouble that they weren't seeking. I did not discuss it in advance with anybody who was above me in the power structure because it didn't seem to me that there were any champions there um, that I could get any support from. I certainly did discuss it in painstaking detail with my wife Karen, um, who, who was uh, works in a, a professional position on environmental issues. She understood the problem perfectly well in my situation. She understood the, the climate change issue, the politics of Washington. She was very supportive. Some whistleblowers, this doesn't happen. I mean, they lose their marriages and, and, and they get, get rejected, you know, even by their um, most close relationships. Um, I, she was very supportive. I would talk with her in great detail about what was going on. I didn't tell her in advance th of the, at the moment that I, I resigned because I didn't know exactly when that was going to be. But the first thing I did was call her and said, OK, I just walked out of there this morning. And she said, let's roll. And um, it's tremendously important to have that support. Uh, the situation was so untenable that although I had hesitated for a long time to make a, a move because it felt like a, a radical move to be making and going into some really unknown uh, territory. Um, it was an existential necessity at that point. The situation was having sort of so much, such a corrosive effect on my spirit and I felt like my hands were tied in terms of what the purpose of what I was there for um, that I had to make the move. But I did have support, yeah, and then I, I soon found support in the public interest world, and that opened doors to a whole new network of, of allies and, and colleagues that wouldn't have been there if I hadn't been bold enough to make a move. Right, okay. All right, well, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about um, how important is the whistleblower journalist relationship um, in all of this when you're trying to set out to make uh, effect oh, real positive change, and that's for any of you. You want to go, Jack? Sure. Um, it's, I, and I've spoken about this uh, several times today. It's essential um, to have um, somebody that you can go to 
uh, that you trust, that you know will do the right kind of journalism um, and get uh, the story right, get the, as we talked about, the, the narrative right and, uh, and allow the public to know really what's going on. Uh, I also had terrific su support from the public uh, and one of those people sitting in here this evening, Vivian Stockman, and uh, uh, her organization, the Ohio Valley Environmental Coalition, and a whole bunch of group, groups together uh, to support me, and they helped also to uh, get the story that I was trying to tell out. And, um, and then, of course, I had for years been leaking to various people. Some of my very best long-term friends are people that I first met when I was giving them a story. And in that very first instance of Buffalo Creek, the reporter that I gave material to, her name is Mary Walton, and we vowed in 1972 to be best friends forever, and we are. <laughs> Still. So, uh, it's, uh, and uh, there's, there are dozens of people over the years who have helped uh, me get out to the public what I wanted to do. Journalism specifically. Journalism especially, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good journalism is important. It's really important. And I've had basically a good uh, relationship with the media. Um, I've, I've done a lot, of, a lot of interviews, both sort of on the record and just on background, TV, films, radio, newspaper, magazines, and so forth. And for the most part, reporters I've worked with get it right. Um, they're, 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 they're really trying to do the right thing. Some of the coverage has been truly excellent and important, I think. Sometimes I'll get a call from a reporter who's not too experienced with it. They haven't done enough homework. Their questions are a little bit skewed. But I'll stop what I'm doing and talk to them for an hour, if necessary, just to coach them on the issue, help them understand what they're reporting on, help them frame their, their story, because I think it's really important you know, to try to get things out through the media. The media can't solve the problem. You know, the sci with climate change, the scientists have identified a problem that they can't solve. It has to be solved in the, in the policy, the political arena, and there needs to be political organization and political pressure and, and more more than what the media can do but uh, the media relations have been really important for what I've, I've tried to accomplish now with Wil uh, Wilma you were trying to make disclosures in a much different media climate than either Jack or Rick because the Deepwater Horizon disaster was the media event of 2010 but the question is what percentage of stories actually included health concerns about the cleanup workers and, uh, you know, what do you think explains the coverage? Well, as a result of the work I was doing, I also developed a health survey and filled it out with a number of the cleanup workers as well as a number of the people in the coastal areas that were being impacted by the crude as it blew in as a dispersant then as it moved on shore and migrated into the bays system. So I was out pushing the issue of this is what it's doing to human health. It's what it's doing to the human health and the workers and human health of the community living in the coastal areas. And then I also did analysis of blood samples of workers and people living in the community. And so at first, no one wanted to touch that story. And then after a while, they sort of settled down. And as you were saying, they call about one aspect because the BP spill was a very complex situation. And then they'd say, well, is there anything else you want to tell me about? So I'd start telling them about the health impacts. And then finally, they started coming around and actually featuring that. And then the issue became that the doctors weren't willing to treat the patients. The issue was they'd go in, they'd show the doctor I had developed health symptoms associated with the crude and with the dispersant, and they'd show it to their doctor, and he'd say, no, you're not sick from any of that. You just have bronchitis, here's some antibiotic go back on your way. And they didn't want to treat the patients, and they didn't want to make the connection to exposure and the health impacts they were experiencing. So it's been a really, really tough fight to get doctors that are really specialists in toxic exposure 
to deal with the hundreds of thousands of victims and why, that were impacted. Why didn't those doctors want to make the connection? The local doctors are also the family physicians and they're also the physicians for the oil companies and the service companies and they do things like pre-employment physicals and when a worker gets injured and that's their bread and butter. And they realized that if they started speaking out and saying, Nancy has health impacts associated with exposure to the BP crude, that they were gonna lose all their oil and gas clients. And then they were gonna be out of work. Their practice would have to be shut down. And that leads very nicely to the next question. And uh, for Rick and Jack, um, you know, other scientists, mine safety experts, must have seen what you did. So why do you think they didn't speak out as vigorously as you did? Well, there were a few other people. Uh, I, uh, one in particular was David McAteer, who was the uh, head of the agency uh, who sent me to uh, Martin County to do the investigation. He certainly spoke out about the, the dangers associated with uh, coal waste dams. And, um, and then there were some people from the United Mine Workers, and I, I was, I was supported by people within the agency who wanted to do their jobs, but they were indeed afraid of losing their jobs if they uh, publicly supported me. So there wasn't much public support from within government agencies. Most of my support came from outside, and it is an economic uh, uh, decision that you make. Um, uh, of course, I, because I'd had the Buffalo Creek experience, I didn't care about the economics of it. It certainly worried me a bit and worried my wife, but, but I was going to go ahead and do it. The important thing is, the, as, as we've said, the, the folks who have the power will use every, every uh, bit of power they have to suppress the truth. And that's why it's really important uh, sometimes the only hope we have of getting the truth out is good journalism, whatever kind of, in whatever form. I mean, once the New York Times did my story, uh, a producer from 60 Minutes read it, and they, then Bob Simon decided to come down and interview me in Kentucky, and that made a big difference. Uh, and it, if, it, if that hadn't happened, if I hadn't had uh, the support from uh, uh, reporters uh, throughout the region and indeed throughout the country, what I did would not have had uh, the meaning that I wanted it to have. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you want to address this question or do you um, want to add something? Yeah, yeah, I can. Um, I, I once talked for a couple hours with a, a screenwriter who was going to write a documentary about global warming and he said at, at the end, I think maybe the most interesting part of your story is the way a whole town uh, full of uh, senior professional people who know better fall silent in the face of egregious misrule. You know, and that's Washington. I call it the silence of the feds. And part of it is the way people sort of trade their freedom of, of, of public voice for inside influence. And I was working under people who had inside influence. They had large budgets. They had, they had reasons to cooperate. They'd not be, the, not be boat rockers, not jeopardize careers, not jeopardize budgets, not take risks. There's a lot of ways to talk yourself out of taking action. And I think, <clears throat> so nobody else was going to do it. And um, I think also even people who might be considering doing some kind of whistleblower action um, are deterred because they think, you know, I'll be punished for it, I'll be, it'll damage me in some way, and nobody will care, you know, it won't do any good. Right. So who am I, anyway? And so... Uh, Would you have done anything differently? If you had to do it over again, and this, you, anybody can address this, would you have done Maybe I wouldn't have waited quite so long, but as it turned out, the timing was pretty good. Actually, I think I, I played my little hand fairly well. I documented what I had. I got good counsel. I didn't blow myself out of the water with a lot of half-baked stuff on the inside to cause them to run me off before I decided that it was 
time to leave. I was, in other words, I did something that felt like a radical act, but I did it sort of deliberatively and in a fairly carefully planned way. So that that worked well, and that's something that I would advise people to do. Right. Okay, before we get to that, let me, let's talk about where society is now, and since <coughs> you still have the microphone, Rick, you obviously still have a lot of contacts who are climate scientists in the government. Uh, what do they feel? Are things markedly different under Obama? I mean, what is the current state of scientific freedom? Well, I, do, I think you don't see the, if, if for the most part, at least in the, in the area that I've worked in, the kind of egregious sort of censorship and misrepresentation. There were several years there where the president kind of fell silent and didn't talk about climate change. Um, just seemed, I guess, to them like a political loser, the whole 2012 election campaign it was never, never discussed. Um, finally, in June, the president gave a, a major address that was pretty good on climate change. And, you know, Washington's at a complete impasse politically. But as far as on the inside, I think the problem, well, I mean, Wilma has experienced, you know, a problem that has occurred under the Obama administration with the misrepresentation of evidence that's politically inconvenient. And I think you, there, I could point to a few other examples where it's not exactly censorship, but where the administration will sort of set science aside where it's inconvenient well, let's set politically. It'd be good to hear from Wilma. I mean, what is the current status of BP settlement with Gulf uh, residents and, um, and with the EPA? So the BP settlement has a lot of phases, and we're in the court case on a lot of aspects. But as part of one of the settlements, BP was allowed to give a large chunk of money to provide primary health care in the coastal states. Now, we desperately need primary health care. We're, you know, number 49, number 50 at the bottom of the list. But the way they set it up, it was excluding any health impacts that were associated with the crude or with the dispersant. Wow. And it is totally inappropriate to BP be allowed to fund primary health care to the exclusion of the health care that all the victims so desperately need. Wow. Like they won't admit to any wrongdoing. No, and they absolutely have not admitted to any wrongdoing in the whole issue. And 11 workers that were killed, all the workers that were injured, it starts from there and just keeps going and going. And every single day, crude oil washes on shore in Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama. The exposure is still going on. How about you, Jack? How about federal mine safety regulations? Are things better now than they were? Uh, yes, the, they are better. Uh, um, but um, in the environmental area, um, they are better in the mine safety and health area, certainly. In the mining environmental area, they are not. The federal agency, uh, the Office of Surface Mining, which is a uh, part of the Department of the Interior, under um, Director Kazarchek, has collapsed as far as being an enforcement agency. It's a huge disappointment to me to see what the Obama administration has done. And I was a supporter of Obama, and I still am, but they, as an administration, have failed utterly to protect the public. They're supposed to oversee the states in the implementation of the Surface Mining Control and Reclamation Act. And they, um, we have, uh, in many of the lawsuits I'm involved in, we have discovered that uh, the agencies responsible have allowed conditions to develop that have resulted in the deaths of people and flooding uh, contamination of water. Uh, if anything, um, I, I have to say probably under Obama um, in the environmental area with mining, uh, things are were better under the first George Bush. Wow, that <laughs> says something. Mm -hmm. All right, let's uh, shift a little bit more. Whistleblowing has been a huge part of public discourse since the Edward Snowden revelations. 
about the scope of NSA uh, surveillance. Uh, this started back in June. So what do each of you think about the language used to describe Snowden? It's ranged from traitor and leaker to hero. I mean, what are your thoughts about the issue? <coughs> I'll take that. Um, I, I think that Ed Snowden has, has done a, a really major public service. I've, the, the Government Accountability Project has become a go-to organization for, for counseling and advocating national security whistleblowers. So I, I've, through that, I've become pretty attuned to this issue. And uh, it seems to me clearly that that Snowden is a whistleblower, that he brought to public attention inside information that he believed to be an abuse of power that the public needed to know about and that he had to take this action, you know, around the authority structure he was in. I think that even, um, I think it's preposterous to call him a traitor. Um, I think that even people who are uncomfortable with his action now that he's, um, Pried the lid off of the, the 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 activities of the surveillance state. I think most people would not want to see that lid put back down and never have learned anything about what's going on because it appears to be an enormous dragnet operation in which the national security apparatus wants to be able to control um, access to and have access to absolutely everything that happens on the internet including your own private communications and it appears to be way beyond way beyond anything that is directly <laughs> focused on counterterrorism and if you have any imagination about how this type of capability could be used to go after people under in the in the wrong hands if you have a really <coughs> authoritarian administration gets in power and, 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 and um, is, is challenged and there are serious terrorist attacks and they decide to use this kind of information to go after dissidents. It's, I mean, the, the prospect of it is potentially very Orwellian and it's definitely something that needs to be discussed in the, in the, in the democratic society about exactly what the rules are for what government should be doing in this area. And Snowden, we wouldn't know anything about any of this, except for the material that his, he's been making available. And it's clearly a discourse that needs to happen. It's interesting to, to psychoanalyze him, and it's an interesting story, but it's not really about him. It's really about the surveillance state, which is a more difficult and complex story to get your arms around. But that's what people really need to be thinking about, I think. Okay. Do either of you want to add to that, or should we? Yeah, okay. Um, now this is something, I mean, you never know what's going to happen in life. And one of uh, you, one of the students here, may find themselves in a few years on the job and uncovering serious wrongdoing. So what single piece of advice do each of you have for the people in the audience? Good question. You want to take that? Get the information that you need. Double check the information with other sources to be sure of what you're putting together is absolutely true. Get input from the other side to understand their perspective. And then put together a story and have a thick skin enough that you're going to get negative responses back but you know that what you put together was the true story and represents the true situation. Jack, do you want to add to that? Or? No, I couldn't say it any better. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think really know what you're doing, know what you're talking about, be able to document it, think very carefully about it, don't be reckless, and don't, don't be careless, um, but, but you, you, you have to live with yourself. I mean, you don't know when you're going to find yourself in a situation, sometimes it's like if you're a, a reporter, sometimes there is the story. You didn't know that it was going to be there, but if you have the wit to see it, you see what your story is. Well, if you're in a professional situation and you see an, a, a really serious wrongdoing, something that's unethical, something that's an abuse of power, there you are. You can walk away from it, which is what most people do and say, it's not my department. 
um, you know, or you can stay focused on it and think, well, who am I, you know, on this planet, and who do who do I have to answer to, and what do I have to do, and then you have to do the right thing because you know that moment passes, and you'll know for the rest of your life that you didn't do the right thing when you had the shot at doing it. So, but just be just be intelligent about how you go about doing it. I mean, in some cases, whistleblowers first go internally to, you know, their, they, they go up the chain of command. You just have to be able to read the particular right. situation you're in. I mean, Jack went to the Office of Special Counsel under the Bush administration. That was an office that was supposed to protect federal whistleblowers, but it really was a place where whistleblower cases went to die and where retaliation got organized, you know. so. Sometimes you can go internally, and sometimes it's extremely risky to go internally. If you can work internally, then do that. But if you have to make a unilateral decision to say, in my judgment, the story has to come out, whether my boss wants it to come out or not. I, you know, I never really thought about this that much before I got, in, got, got into the situation myself. Now I've come to sort of think of, of whistleblowing as a sort of under-supported and under appreciated form of public service when it's done, you know, appropriately, um, and that there really should be a lot more of it. I mean, there's all sort of corporate institutions, the financial institutions. If we had more people, more young people who, 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 who see what's going on, who would make the decision to say, okay, fellow citizens, I can explain to you what's actually going on here. Think of what a service that could be. There should be much more of it, in my opinion. Great. Well, before we, we're about to move on to your questions, um, but if you're, I just wanted to make a plug for uh, GAP. If you're moved by what you're, you hear today um, and would like to know more about whistleblowing and whistleblowers, uh, please consider visiting the website at whistleblower.org. And now I'd be happy to field questions. Unfortunately, we don't have a mic for the audience, so if you have a question, please stand up and. Uh, uh, talk loud. Yes. Uh, this group, this panel is professional, mature, competent. Where does the gravity of humanity fit into this? Good question. Who wants to tackle that? <laughs> well, he didn't follow all of the guidelines that I just suggested. If you find yourself in that <coughs> position, he, she, I guess we should say she now. Um, uh, but I do think that Bradley Manning uh, was a whistleblower, um, was trying to perform a public service and provoke a public debate about the things that he was documenting that were wrong. I think that you can arguably question the, whole, the idea of doing a wholesale document dump, although I notice that the leading mainstream media used that information to break about a hundred stories most of which were stories about official wrongdoing here and in other countries. And so a lot of valuable material came out of that. Uh, he's really the only one who got prosecuted for it. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a complex problem because, because he came at it from a, a psychologically very troubled place. But it doesn't seem to me that his revelations have done any real harm to the national interest and in fact arguably have done a lot of good in terms of how journalism has been able to use it to break important stories that we wouldn't have known about otherwise. Interesting. Um, other questions? Yes. Do you want to stand up and uh, say who you'd like to answer the question? Um, I guess this is mainly addressed to Mr. Spadaro, um, uh, but maybe um, Wilma also. Um, I'm kind of curious about, uh, have you thought about, as the GAP organization and as a national group, how does the influence of local kind of cultures or cultures specific to certain kinds of corporate environments, how, it, um, how does that make it different? Like in both of those two cases, um, there was a, an industry that was key to the economy of a region that was involved in what you were working with and do you 
do you think in retrospect that there were any aspects of your situation that might have been different because of that or and particularly for Mr. Spadaro um, I wondered if you could comment about the current culture inside MSHA you said things had improved under Obama I think you meant inside MSHA um, but I think I read something a comment from you about the collapse in Lumberport um, near here uh, a few months ago and personally I have wondered if there is going to be any political will to stay on the case about that because there were other similar type accidents. Uh, yes, I am um, I'm certainly disappointed with MSHA uh, in regard to many things, uh, but I'll have to say with MSHA now uh, at least uh, uh, regular mine inspectors are encouraged uh, far more than they were under the George W. Bush administration to do their jobs and they're supported in doing their jobs. But there are uh, and, and, and there are failures at the highest levels in that agency to uh, grapple with some of the serious problems like the continued uh, potential for failure of coal stands where uh, one person was killed uh, back in uh, the winter. Um, and I'm, I'm continuing to work on that as well as dealing with coal ash dams at power plants. Um, I, I think also uh, one of the things I want to emphasize when we're talking about culture, there is so, it, there is so much courage among the people that I have worked with in the coal fields because they do indeed risk their lives because they are they are dealing with an industry that can be ruthless and some of my friends have had their lives threatened one friend in particular uh, Maria Gano had to wear a, a bulletproof vest to pick up her kid at the school bus stop and I'm not exaggerating that happened. Oh, yeah. and she had to build a security fence around her house because the managers of the mine had convinced their employees that she was a threat to their jobs. And that goes on a lot, but the people in the coal fields, the people, the real culture of the coal fields is, is, um, is strong and brave, and I'm glad to be able to help them some. So, so there, the culture at, in some of the agencies um, it continues to be a disappointment to me, and, and MSHA is one of those agencies. Things are better, but uh, we're, they're still making the same mistakes that led to things like the Upper Big Branch disaster where 29 miners died. That should never have happened 40 years after, uh, after uh, some of the disasters that I worked on back in the 70s. It's absolutely inexcusable that happened, and it was during the uh, the uh, Obama administration uh, that there was a, a collapse really in the uh, enforcement program. It has changed since Upper Big Branch, but um, what happened there was inexcusable. So particularly on the issue of culture, um, GAP is representing some of the members of Louisiana Environmental Action Network and the health impact as a result of the exposure to the crude and to the dispersant, and attempting to work with BP to get them to agree to phase out or quit using the dispersants in response to oil spills. But it has to be through a local group. You can't just expect someone from the outside to be able to come in and they're as specific with the kinds of cultures we have in Louisiana and Mississippi and Alabama. You have to have a local group. So working through lean, they're able to work with the different aspects of culture and get those people to be part of this process. But Louisiana Environmental Action Network is the key for GAP to work with those victims. Great. Lois? Um, so my question has to do with the backside of whistleblowing, like after it happens. and. Um, 
I mean, from everything that you've said, it's a hugely personal thing. I mean, you're, you're part of the culture. And, the, and uh, I mean, Louie, I see you more as like a watchdog. You're a terrier at the, the, at the leg, and it's not just one moment of whistleblowing. You're clearly involved on the backside of following up and doing all of that. But so I guess my question is that personally, your life gets turned around after this happened. So after that, since you've been part of it for so long and you have this deep knowledge, are you then, are you then responsible to every person who comes to you and they want you to go line by line on the document what did you know so your your former career is now at least that on a job position is gone but how do you have to engage with the world after this as a major whistleblower as the expert on this particular topic people coming to you do you have to sift through people who are extremists and what part of your current life does that play in the aftermath does that make sense I th it, it, it makes I'm not sure I com completely understand the, the question but I, I was I was able to to devise a follow-up project that enabled me to continue working on the problem that I had identified essentially it was it was a niche there was I mean on the inside it was like why is why is the media not covering the story better and it became, it was clear, because there is inside information that they don't have that would enable them to tell this story better, and I'm the story. So I finally put that out, and that helped to reframe some of the media coverage. But there was still nobody who was waking up every morning thinking about how are government officials misrepresenting what the world of climate science is trying to tell them about this urgent problem. Um, and there I was inside the Beltway. So I said, okay, well, I'm the watchdog. I will write about it. I'll speak about it. I'll continue to track this issue and, and work with the, allies. Yeah. And was. Exactly the climate science and, watch. And, and, and climate science, well, but, 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 but Gap, yeah. Gap, yeah. GAP supported climate science watch and, and helped find a way to, to keep that support. And, create an opportunity to work on that. So I, I, I work on it sort of as an, as an independent voice, but under the organizational support of GAP. Now, most whistleblowers are, are not in a, don't, don't end up kind of like running a project that goes sort of beyond their own particular story. And, and really for a long time, the only thing that people wanted to ask me was, to, well, tell that story again which I'm happy to do, but there were, a, there were a lot of other things to talk about that were coming out as other people came forward, other people in the federal government and in the science community. Um, and the global warming denial machine, as I came to call it, the organized ideological and industry supported effort to misrepresent the science in order to ward off regulation. Um, continued DAC, continued its war on climate science and its attacks on the integrity of climate scientists. There were a lot of stories to tell and over time through documenting a lot of this and writing about it and framing it through the climatesciencewatch.org, um, you know, w w was able to sort of move beyond the initial whistleblower story to a post-whistleblower framework of, of being able to cover those related issues as they came up. So being, being a particular type of expert and people would come to me then to talk about what was happening, the new stuff that was happening, basically. Most, most of the people, well, Jim Hansen, the, the most eminent climate scientist in the federal government who ran the, the key lab at NASA, and was making very strong statements about the, the climate change problem, was told, you know, don't give interviews, no, you're not going to go on NPR, don't put stuff on your website without clearing it with headquarters, you know, refer interview requests to headquarters and so forth. And he went to the New York Times and they reported his whistleblower story and, 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 and NASA had to back off of him because he was bold and he was an eminent scientist. Other people did too, but usually they did not want to, 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 to go public with their name, but they would feed inside information. There's ways to be a whistleblower and still 
you know, not put yourself in the in the, the public eye or in the crosshairs by putting information out. You can take information to the press if you if you do it in a way that you know that's that's appropriate. You can take it to Congress. I mean, if you're in Washington and that's something really serious, there there are ways to bring information out. And so mostly, what would come to me from inside sources was. Well, here let me. T here's what's going on here. Here's what's going on there, and then I would work work the story for them because I was already out. Did uh, Wilma or Jack? Do you want to address the Lois's question about? Do you? I mean, because I know um, Wilma, for instance, gets calls all the time from people from all over the country who have a story to tell. And how do you sift through who has valid uh, complaints and who might be? Uh, whatever. <laughs> so I get a lot of emails and a lot of phone calls from communities that have seen my name out there or someone told them I got a call today from someone in North Louisiana who the agency had actually referred them to me. But he couldn't tell me who in the agency. But you work with the community, you ask them what the situation is, you start looking up things on the internet or in the files and you can quickly determine whether or not it's real or it's not. And then you do what you can to help educate and empower that community about the situation in their community so they can start speaking up with knowledge. And then if you have to, you go with them to the agencies or you go with them to the elected officials. And But you build their power base so they represent their issues. The worst thing is some of the organizers want to capture the victims and they want to speak for the victims. And that's totally inappropriate. The issue is you have to educate the community and let them make decisions in their own community based on what's going on, both politically and scientifically. Jack, I think you had something you wanted to say. Thank you. Yes. Um, so one of the things that I had to grapple with right after I left my job was, OK, my career is over. What am I going to do? Uh, and so I, uh, I didn't realize it, but I certainly was very, very depressed for a number of years. Uh, and, um, and then slowly um, I started being asked to uh, serve as an expert witness in court cases that involved public safety, uh, minor safety, and the safety uh, and well-being of communities. So. Um, uh, now I work every day helping individuals, families, um, uh, unfortunately uh, sometimes widows of minors uh, um, and do um, litigation. I, I work with their attorneys and that's very rewarding work um, and um, I'm happy to be able to do it uh, and that's the way I've been uh, following up, I do get lots of calls, ask for help. If I if I can't help a community or an individual, I'm still able to find somebody who can. And that's very good. Okay. Any other? Uh, Joe. Yes. Um, this will be the last question, I think. Yes. Uh, I I kind of have two parts to this question. One is that there tends to be in the media a well, we have to look at both sides. Now, like with the climate change issue, you know, it's like the both sides are not within the scientific community, but they're more ideological. Um, and I wondered how much that affects what you do because it's all, uh, you know, environmental stuff. So it's jobs against the environment. And especially in this uh, time when the economy is an issue, the, the middle class is disappearing. What sort of impact does that have on your work, trying to you know, get this, get this uh, complicated message? Well, I think climate change has always been a difficult one for the media to deal with and make stories out of it because of the long-term nature and the, the technical scientific issues and so forth. But for a lot, a long time, and, and even to some extent now, the media coverage is plagued by what I call fake balance. You know, I mean, for, for certain kinds of issues where it's just a matter of opinion one way or the other, you can say, well, this side says this and this side says that. Um, 
even on policy questions, expertise should matter some, but on, a, on science, when you have the National Academy of Sciences puts out a major report that says something about the climate change problem, it shouldn't be necessary for the reporter to go find some petroleum geology professor somewhere who says, well, I don't believe in global warming, you know, and, and think they've done their job because they've presented both sides. It's kind of intellectually lazy. It's not the way to cover science issues. If you're not an expert, if it's a question of expert credibility, you need to tune yourself into who are the most credible experts and th th those, you know, if, and if you're not a specialist, then pay attention to the major scientific assessments in the major scientific organizations and the leading scientists, you know, and, uh, and, and, and um, so that's, that's part of it. But there's plenty to debate about policy, the economics of different responses to climate change, and how you do preparedness to deal with climate change impacts, how you prepare communities to be more resilient, how you make a transition in the energy system and what it's going to cost and who's going to be regulated. There's plenty to discuss that are legitimate political discussions. But it's really important to have this relationship between experts and policymakers or experts in society be a, a, a clear, honest one that has integrity. So you don't want people who, who don't have integrity but are protecting a vested interest, you know, throwing flack into that that interaction and mudding the waters and I mean it's just heartbreaking to see how difficult it is for this country to even have an intelligent discussion of the problem of global climatic disruption and our contribution to it and its potential implications I mean we've just not been able to rise to the something that's commensurate with the urgency and significance of the problem it's a, we just seem to be unable to be intelligent as a society about it it's taking a long time and the political interference with that you know is just really unacceptable and needs to be combated I think um, okay well uh, oh hi there Matthew um, I, I, we're at the uh, end so you have a really quick question yes I do okay all right my question is, uh, how has the Ed Snowden situation caused certain types of investigative journalism to be borderline treason under the current political environment? Wait, how has the Ed Snowden situation how's caused... The, how's the Ed Snowden situation caused certain types of investigative journalism to be borderline treason under the current political environment? What, is that, what does that mean? I'm not quite sure I understand. Well, I'm talking about the harassment of Ed Greenwald and his partner. Is that what you're talking well, about? That, that that oh, that oh I see what you're saying is cr the criminalizing of investigative that's journalism. That's exactly. How is, how is that uh, affected whistleblowers now? Like, if you, want, if you have information, I mean, what, what do you do? You if a journalist is not allowed to protect their sources, it certainly does have a chilling effect on people. <laughs> Who would like to bring uh, bring stories forward, and they can have a chilling effect on journalists as well. And it's it's a real problem under the Justice Department under this administration. They've had a more prosecutorial attitude uh, approach to whistleblower, at least in the national security area, uh, than anyone has had. It's 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 like no matter who wins the election, they seem to be captive to the national security surveillance state, which seems to be now aggrandizing itself and running on its own momentum in a way that's d difficult, difficult to get a grip on. But when they start um, threatening to throw journalists in, in, in jail because they've had an interaction with the national security whistleblower, it's a real, yeah, it's a real problem, I think. Thank first of all our guest speakers for being here and let's give them a big hand.